I'd like to welcome you to our council meeting back here at the chambers <laughs> this March the 25th, 2021, in the interest of time efficiency and ensuring that everyone who wishes to address the council is given the opportunity to do so. The following will apply to all comments made by the public. If you desire to be recognized by the chair, please fill out a request form and present it to the city clerk present here in council chambers. Each speaker shall be allotted three minutes to address the council unless such time is extended by the mayor or by questions from council. Groups shall designate a spokesperson to avoid repetition of comments. Every effort will be made to avoid interrupting speakers. And with that, we thank you for participating in your city government. We also ask that you please silence all of your electronic devices. With that, I call uh, this council meeting to order. Our invocation will be shared by Pastor Randy Law, who is also with the National Day of Prayer of Osceola County. And if you will, please stand after which remain standing uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Prayer first. Oh, prayer first. Okay. Yeah, you're first. <laughs> The reason that we're here and the reason that we're praying. Uh, Paul says this, here then is my charge. First supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving should be made on behalf of all men for kings and rulers in positions of responsibility so that our common life may be lived in peace and quiet with a proper sense of God and of our responsibility to him for what we do with our lives. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you just Bless the city, Lord. I ask that you bless these councilmen, those in positions of authority, O oh Lord, that have decisions to make. Only you know the future. May they be led by you. We ask, Father, that we honor you in all that we do in this city. Lord, that we not fear man, but that we fear you, Lord. You are the one with the final say, Lord. May our lives and may this city honor you in all that they do. Father, give them wisdom, give them discernment, guide them in all the decisions. Let them see when there's falsehood. Lord, let them be able to have that discernment and see right through it. Let them walk and stand in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much for me. Standing for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. May be seated. <coughs> Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Blackwell? Here. Deputy Mayor Trace? Here. Councilmember Matheny? Here. Councilmember Cooper? Councilmember Askew? Here. With that, our first event of the afternoon is a presentation regarding OUC time uh, of use pilot program and Mindy and Terry it's good to have you guys here if you'll step up and introduce yourself for the record sure uh, good afternoon oh maybe it's early evening <laughs> mayor Blackwell council members my name is Mindy Brene I am the CFO at Orlando Utilities Commission so we're here today I believe we have a presentation that should be coming up on the slide deck in front of us. It is on three topics. One is the upcoming pricing changes, which we presented to the OUC board in January, and which were approved in the March timeframe that will be effective on April 1. We'll give a preview that those price changes are what we call revenue neutral, with lower fuel prices being offset by offsetting customer charge and energy prices. So designed to be revenue neutral. Then we'll also share a little bit about the time it, oh, yep, thank you, that's okay. Um, then we'll also share a little bit about the time of use pricing pilot, which we are launching on April 1, which is our first new alternative pricing design. We have traditionally only had one pricing option. This is our first foray into new pricing options and it will be piloted. And then the third slide, uh, Terry Torrens will present to you. It is an update on the decommissioning of the St. Cloud City power plant. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, 
I'll let you know. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, do that old school. <laughs> 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 um, sure, I wanted to give you a background first. This is uh, very similar to the presentation we shared with the city board, the OUC board. Um, our pricing recommendations were originally designed to be effective on October 1 of 2020. We had projected that looking forward into the forecast, but certainly COVID challenged us and asked us, you know, challenged us to think about what was right for the customers, particularly during this time of COVID-19. While we're still, we seem to be coming out of it, we still recognize that our customers need to be, we need to be sensitive to that. And so with that, we made our price, whoa, I'm, I'll get used to this yet. Uh, we made our price changes revenue neutral. So moving forward on to the next slide, just a little bit of background. OUC is a municipal utility, public power. Um, we are designed to be, um, our prices are designed to be cost neutral. So similar to a not-for-profit, if there are revenues or expenses that are incurred above or beyond budget, we, have, we take uh, an accounting action that gets approved by the board and we return those changes back to the customer. So really it is designed to be cost-based. On that pricing methodology, our pricing is designed to really be stable and predictable over the long term. So the chart on the right really shows you our efforts to bring forth price changes that are stable and you can see in 2012, our price was at 113.81 for 1,000 kilowatts a month, which is the average industry standard that we compare ourselves to. And then in 2021, that price is 113.88. So a seven cents change over almost a decade. Um, that is a combination of leveraging fuel savings over this period, as well as low interest saving, low interest rates and savings that we have leveraged through bond refundings. Again, we pass them back to the customer, always trying to deliver price uh, stability and predictability in our product, recognizing, of course, that we are an essential service. When it comes to the methodology of allocating our prices between commercial and re residential, we look at the different ways that our energy is used, and we are thoughtful about that as well. And the third principle we consistently apply is looking at how we can encourage conservation and the prudent use of energy resources. Particularly as we look at launching into the future and clean energy, we really want to encourage that, that whole concept of conservation and prudent energy usage. And that is really the basis for time of use as well. So if you'll move forward to the next slide. He Oh, those numbers are really small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, OK, and I don't have them memorized. But I will do my best and maybe look to you to give me a little bit of uh, two cents here. I'm not sure why they're so small. Anyhow, OK, the price changes that are, can you see them on your, I cannot. They were not that way earlier this week. Anyhow, uh, one needs to be uh, spontaneous. Um, so the price changes are designed to be price neutral. Uh, that is a almost an eight percent. Do you want me to? One thirty, one forty for hey, wait, one thirty-two price. Okay, <laughs> and you'll whisper in my ear. Yes. Um, okay, so the prices are designed again to be to really take advantage of that low natural gas cost that we have seen throughout the nation, really at less than $3 a, a technical MMBTU. But uh, all of that is about an 8% reduction in the fuel price, offset by an increase in the customer charge, $2.60, bringing the customer charge up to $15.60. That has been a long-term initiative that we have had. We have been slowly moving that price up as we've leveraged fuel savings over the last five years. And then for energy usage beyond 1,000 kilowatts, we are promoting and really um, incentivizing our customers to use less than that. And so that incremental amount above 1,000 kilowatts, that price will, will rise to $2, well, two cents 
from 2.08 cents to 2.6 cents. I don't know how to say that well. Um, anyhow, so I think the chart on the right, um, if it was a little clearer, would share with you that unlike the standard measure that the industry uses of 1,000 kilowatts per month, the St. Cloud service territory is primarily comprised of single family homes, and the average usage for single family homeowners is about 1,200 kilowatts per month. So we wanted to give you a comparison that was most reflective to St. Cloud in comparison to KUA. OUC's rates are, tell me again, Terry? 140 for KUA and 132 for OUC. So KUA's rates for 1,200 kilowatts are 140 and some pennies, and OUC's rates are 132. So overall, we, we continue to deliver value for the St. Cloud City customers. I'll stop and answer any questions you may have. Yes? Go ahead. Um, just for the record, because I have it on my computer here, it's 140 um, and 40 cents for KUA and 138 and 74 cents for St. Cloud. Just one. Thank you. Thank you. I would certainly like to express my appreciation to OUC for the assistance that you've given so many of our customers during uh, these unprecedented times, and thank you for uh, all of the help and patience and benevolence uh, that you have done during these uh, difficult times for a lot of our residents. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions? Oh, I see you waving You're there. used to looking the, that way. I don't, I don't see questions. a light on, so. Oh, sorry. We're back in lights. Yeah. I'm back in lights. So um, thank you for the presentation. And I just wanted to have you clarify something, because I didn't get it out of the presentation. It's a lot of information. Because when it was presented, you know, there's like, it's price neutral. And I'm like, wait, but you're increasing this, and you're increasing this. Like, uh, how is this price neutral? So then she explained to me how the bill is comprised. So I'd like if you could do that. So, sure. you know, the fuel costs went down and other items went up, but overall, like the bill to the residents should be unchanged. But I just want her to like clarify that because that was something okay. for me. I was like, how is the price neutral? Like all I'm seeing is increases. So, yeah. So the fuel rate is going down by 8%. It's actually 7.8%. And the two components of the customer charge and the incremental amount over 1,000 kilowatts, when you look at a customer using 1,000 kilowatts, that is designed to be the exact same price. And overall, th this chart really shows how we compare to KUA, but it is designed to keep the price the same for that industry standard. And our bill, um, while most customers see the bottom line of the bill, we have uh, three lines on there, which is the fuel line, the energy line, and the customer charge line. So I hope that clarifies that. It does, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? And then I, I certainly thank you for the comment on the COVID-19 customer relief. Um, that has been absolutely a priority initiative for us. We continue to support that um, with payment plans. We recently issued some bonds, and we had a lot of feedback from the rating agencies on that. And we currently have about $3 million in residential receivables that we have allowed for payment plans to continue to help customers. So we continue to work on that, just not as directly through the Project Care Fund, but continue to support that. So you can go move forward. We like to be very transparent. Um, and this is the exact same slide I shared at, we had a clean energy workshop in November, and then I uh, shared this again in our January pricing workshop. We do see price pressures. We are always looking for ways that we can offset them, but the green slide, the green bar on the left shows the current business as usual pressures, which uh, really are around systems hardening, resiliency to the, the energy system, rising transmission costs as we really look to transition to renewable energy. Those, transi those transmission costs are rising as well. And then like, ev like many, many, many other businesses and not uncommon to us, uh, cybersecurity and the protection of our, our uh, assets as well as our customers' information is a priority for us. So we see those 
as cost pressures into the future. On the right, we have shared with you that at the current forecast that we have in front of us as a result of the clean energy plan that got presented and approved in December, we do see 1% price increases into the future as we transition to 2030 at a 50% um, target of clean energy, which is for us primarily solar with energy storage behind that. So if there are no other questions, I will really launch into time of use, which is a component of our clean energy plan. And yes, you can move that slide forward for me. Um, with the clean energy plan, we really are looking to heighten customer awareness on energy usage. Time of use is a way to do that. I informally like to call this the, our version of nights and weekends from the telephone, um, cell phone usage debt probably maybe, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. Um, but it's our first foray into alternative pricing. We have traditionally had only one pricing model for residential customers. This will allow customers really to empower them to really help them save money on their energy bill. You can move forward. Thank you. So time of use, uh, as I shared, is really designed, again, like our traditional pricing, it is not designed to be price neutral. So if the customer continues to use energy the way they have used it in the past, it should be price neutral. But if they choose to move around, again, the numbers are really small, um, if they choose or they tend to if they change their usage pattern, so if they turn their pool pump on, or if they charge their EV, or if they do their laundry at night, or really ch change their energy usage pattern, they have the uh, option to deliver a lower energy bill to them. And that energy savings for the customer also helps us promote sustainability and defer the addition of new generation on the system. So we're really looking to what we historically in the industry call shave the peak because we have to have generation for those really critical times when everybody needs and everybody comes home and wants to turn their air conditioning on at the same time. So we build for those peak times. We're really looking to encourage people to change their pattern and deliver savings. We set up a time of use pilot. It has 700 customers. On the next slide, I'll show you the breakout of demographics of those customers. They were voluntarily, um, I would say solicited, voluntarily to participate on this program. Uh, we have done a lot of research, marketing research, to really better understand how we can promote this program going forward and really ensure that we deliver the right messaging so customers can really take advantage of it. And that's what the pie chart shows you, the demographics that we were able to break out our residential customer base on. And we have in the 700 customers on the pilot, we have 153 of them that are participating in the St. Cloud service territory. There are milestones in this program to engage the customers to really help us give feedback and learn as we pilot this program over the next year. So we're really excited. This launches on April 1, the same time that the pricing changes launch. Um, but we're really looking forward to getting engagement with our customers. It is a nice pairing of this initiative along with clean energy. So we continue to heighten the awareness of energy usage across the community. If there are no other questions, um, I will hand the mic over to Terry, who will share with you the update on the power plant. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, Mayor Blackwell, City Council, Mr. Sturgeon, oh. Terry. I'm sorry. We <laughs> left you um, the brochures. This is our brochure for the time of use pilot. We have left some with Bill. I forgot I that was in. Thank <laughs> you. <okay. laughs> anyway, Terry Torrens, uh, OUC, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an update. We haven't, uh, as you know, we have a um, generation site project that the city of St. Cloud and OUC is working on together. We're just getting to uh, the kickoff. We had a kickoff, if you want to go to the next slide. 
Um, so we had a project kickoff meeting on March 2nd um, between uh, Geocentric, our consultants, OUC, and the City of St. Cloud. In that meeting, it was defined as who were the contact folks and what roles everybody would be playing and kind of laid things out for the future to make sure we had a good communication plan moving forward. Um, what is the next step that's going to be happening out there is just to give you a little bit of a refresher. The last time we were here in front of you guys, we had done soil and water sampling, but we did not get complete vertical and horizontal delineation. So how wide is wide and how deep is deep. Um, and so the next step is additional soil and water samples to get full vertical and horizontal delineation. And when we get to that point, uh, then the next thing is, is we move forward to, with a full cleanup project that goes uh, to get approved by the Department of Environmental Protection. As you know, you guys entered into the voluntary cleanup agreement between the state of Florida and the city of St. Cloud. Um, and what we're doing at this point in time as part of that process of our meetings is OUC and the city of St. Cloud are working together to get a template that will be delivered to the interlocal meetings that OUC and the city of St. Cloud have to give a regular update on the project. So where are we at the project? What have we completed? What are next steps? And financially, where, where everything stands. And that's about all I have to say about that at this point in time, because there's just not a lot gone on. But does anybody have any questions I can answer? Or not answer? <laughs> or try to Councilor answer? Councilor Matheny. I like having she the button the again. I got the button again. Um, <clears throat> so when I had my briefing um, with OUC, I did ask them, um, you know, we made decisions about the course of the project with the information we had at the time that we had it. So as they get further information, if they, if there's something that comes up that would create a project pivot, you know, it would be my expectation that it would get brought back to council to rediscuss it. If there was some differing, you know, news than what we had been briefed in back in the workshop. So I don't know if the other council members feel the same way on that. I know, you know, we, I don't expect that there's going to be anything different, but you know, more data, we might have other discussions that need to be had. Like any project, I'd, it'd be nice to get a quarterly budget and schedule update. And you know, if we mm -hmm. have those pivot points, it, it'd be mm -hmm. nice to talk about it at that point. Yeah, so part of the, our quarterly interlocal meeting, we will generate a report where you'll be able to see what we know, what we're moving towards, and what the finances are on the project. And so that gets presented at the interlocal, and we can certainly make that part of a regular update to the city council. That'd be great for me. I would like that. Thank you. Yeah, I you know me, like I like that. to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? No, that's it. Thank you. All right. well, thank you very much. We Thanks. certainly look forward to moving forward with that project for sure. Thank you. At this time, we come to our Citizens Forum. Any person who desires to comment on any item not on this agenda is provided this opportunity to address the City Council. Each person is requested to complete a signing form to provide it to the presiding officer prior to or as soon as is practical thereafter the person addresses the Council. Is there anyone here that would like to speak to the Council about an item not on the agenda? Mr. Rollins, you need to step forward. You need to step forward, Mr. Rollins, to the mic. Uh, that's John. You don't think that's on the agenda? That'll come up later. He's okay, here that, for the agenda item. Okay. If not, we'll move to our consent agenda. The next portion of tonight's meeting is the consent agenda, which contains items that have been determined to be routine and non-controversial. If anyone in the audience wishes to address a particular item on the consent agenda. Now is the opportunity for you to do so. Additionally, if staff or members of the City Council wish to speak on a consent item, they have the same opportunity. I see a light here. Uh, is that your light? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think I'd like to pull item B off the agenda. Okay, item B will be pulled from the agenda. Are there any other items at the Council remaining you want to address? If not, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to any item on the consent agenda? Is this on the consent agenda? If you want to come up to the mic. Are you wanting to come to the mic? 
No. Your item is on the. Are you going? What item are you wanting to speak to? Consent agenda. That's not. It's not time yet. No, that's council action. I'm sorry. All right. All right. Do we have any discussion and or motion by council? Motion, motion to approve the consent agenda items A and C. Second. We have a motion from council member Trey, second from council member Matheny for the approval of items A and C. Madam Clerk, you please call the roll. Council member Matheny. Aye. Council member Askew. Aye. Deputy Mayor Trace. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries four to zero. The next portion of tonight's meeting are our public hearings. Madam Clerk, will you please read item number one. Final public hearing for ordinance number 2020-29. An ordinance to the City Council of the City of St. Cal, Florida, assigning a zoning district of highway business compatible with commercial future land use designation change adopted by ordinance number 2020-28 <coughs> for approximately 3.53 acres identified as Big Sky Storage Development located east of Big Sky Boulevard North of East Earl Bronson Memorial Highway, providing for entering the designation of official zoning map, following the Planning Commission's recommendations, proof of publication, severability, and effective date. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. Good evening. Andre Anderson, Community Development Director. Um, this is an item that was already approved by the City Council and essentially a rehearing of that item. Um, it is the Big Sky Storage um, Ordinance 2020-29. Um, this is essentially a single purpose um, public hearing item. It is to revise one of the whereas clauses to remove it from the adopted ordinance, which made reference to a major corridors overlay, which um, at the time staff was working on that project. But um, at a subsequent city council workshop, um, the council decided to discontinue proceeding with the major corridors overlay and instead address um, the, the concerns through enhanced architectural, non-residential architectural standards. So again, this relates to um, its existing zoning. Everything remains the same, nothing has changed. And it's consistent with our growth management strategic plan goal. And DNC and staff back in December recommend approval with the condition um, as referenced there um, related to ensuring that the plan is consistent with the Kimley Horn conceptual plan dated December 10th. Um, um, City Council action, of course, was to approve it. Um, it was a pass by vote four to one and um, asked that you re-adopt ordinance 2020-29 to remove the whereas clause in the preamble of the ordinance and adopt it as was recommended initially. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Is there anyone else to speak to this item? I don't know. I'm not really sure. All right. I don't, I don't think so. Would anyone in the audience like to speak to this item? If not, we'll have discussion and or motion by council. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion from council member Matheny. We have a second from council member Askew. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council member Askew. Aye. Deputy Mayor Trace. Aye. Councilmember Matheny. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to the next portion of tonight's, tonight's meeting, which is the council action. Brings us to item number one. Madam Clerk, you read that. Resolution number 2021-025R, a resolution of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, to accept and adopt the Chisholm Park Master Plan dated February 10, 2020. Good evening, everyone. I um, want to warn you that I am fully vaccinated, but also suffering from allergies. So I apologize. I promise I'm not, <laughs> I'm not spreading anything. My name is Kristen Caborn. I'm the Director of Park Planning at GAI Consultants. Thank you so much for having us back tonight. Looking forward to talking to you about both Chisholm Park and Florida Avenue this evening. These are very brief presentations. It's going over a lot of the information that you have already seen. So if you have any questions for me, please, by all means, feel free to ask. Kelly? 
Uh, just a real quick overview of the public engagement that we did. Because we started this program after COVID, we created in-house a website to solicit public feedback. We actually had uh, quite a bit of responses. We had a lot of the activities that we would typically do at an in-person meeting available on the website. City helped us advertise it and we got quite a bit of participation that way. And then a little bit later on in the summer, we did a live Zoom public meeting where we also um, mirrored a lot of the things that we asked on the website and were able to get some additional information. Next slide. So just a real quick overview of what we did. We brought up an aerial of Chisholm Park and we created the opportunity for people to leave comments of things they like, things they don't like. It included very simple instructions. We got 38 pins associated with that. We also have a really fun exercise where we get people to build their dream park. If budget weren't an option, which of course we know it is, um, what would you like to see in the park in the future? So we asked them to play park planner as they're participating in this. This had 148 responses. And then we also did an online survey monkey survey. So this is the summary, the park program. Um, when we talk about park programs, we talk about the types of things that people want to do in the park. And this formed the basis for what we designed in the master plan. We heard that people wanted multi-use and walking trails. Of course, there's already quite a bit of that at Chisholm Park that people are taking advantage of. More picnic opportunities, nature-themed play or obstacle course, fishing pier, native plant landscape, educational signage, observation tower, somewhere where you can get up above the tree canopy and see the lake and do some bird watching. Very passive but very popular outdoor recreation activity. Open beach area, kayaking and boating with rental options, so an opportunity for an outfitter to be on site and be able to provide rentals. A splash pad, a dog park, improved parking and imp improved restroom. And I do want to make a note about the parking facilities. Right now, the parking is really right on the lake, and that's some pretty pristine real estate. So we looked at that really hard, and how can we meet the Battle of Narcoosie's needs? How can we meet the heavy boat traffic needs on the weekends with people who want to launch their boats? So we looked at parking and circulation with a very critical eye on how we could solve some of that. All right, so here's just another summary of what we heard um, at the public workshop. We talked about the different locations for dog parks, the, per the preferred parking configuration, how people felt about grass parking, and then the preferred observation tower location. And all of that resulted in the final master plan. Boy, that's really small. <laughs> I think I have the same, the same problem as OUC did in that I can't read that. But generally, you can see the image on the left is the blown out image of the entire park from Rommel Road up to the park entrance. So that's the overall master plan. There's no difference between what you're seeing on the left and what you're seeing on the right. What you're seeing on the right is just a zoomed in area to the major part of the park that has activity centers. So we've got the, um, as you enter the park, we actually have the dog park up at the North Park with the idea that we're keeping the dogs a little bit separated from the park users and that the dog park hours can protect, perhaps vary a little bit beyond the, uh, beyond the overall park hours. So that entrance is up at the top. We also have parking. We've largely kept the softball, t-ball field um, in the same place. We've improved drainage throughout the site. So one of the challenges with this is as soon as you get east of the tree canopy, the very beautiful tree canopy that we've preserved, the site is very wet. And that can also be a challenge for the Battle of Narcusi. So there are swales running throughout there. We've made an effort to try and improve the stormwater and have the areas that are supposed to stay dry stay dry throughout it. You can see we also um, have expanded the beach area. We have some boardwalks along the lakefront to bring people closer to the water and also offer fishing opportunities. We have the observation deck is coming out. It's that jagged line that is on the south side of the beach. And then below that, we're showing a kayak launch. One of the advantages to that is it's separating where the kayaks and the people-powered vehicles, if you will, are going in the water from um, the motor-powered vehicles. So that's a really nice area for that. We also have a turnaround drop-off um, for vehicles who are going to be dropping off their own kayaks. It's a great location if there is, in fact, going to be a vendor. And then coming south from there, you can see as we get more into the Battle of Narcusi site, and if you all see something I'm missing, let me know, because I am looking at that graphic and can't see a thing, so I'm going from memory. I know this plan pretty well. 
So as you come south, um, we've got another parking area for Battle of Narcusi. We've got the existing pond that's out there that might be expanded a little bit once the park got into design and we took a harder look at at um, stormwater in the area, but also another fishing opportunity that's a great spot for a potentially stocked lake for fishing opportunities. Again, maintaining the trails through the canopy and offering an opportunity for different trail experiences in the same park, both upland and tree canopy. And I think I've covered it all. Next slide. Oh, we have zoom-ins. Okay, great. Look at that. <laughs> Again, zoom-in of the boat ramp, the dog park area, the, the parking area, the existing ball field, some, part, some additional parking that helps clean that area up a little bit. Um, as you move south, you can see the beach seawall that's running along the beach. Picture what you have at Lakefront Park right now with the opportunity for people to sit and relax on the beach wall. Next slide. Uh, zoom in on the fishing pier, splash pad, picnic area, and pavilions. You can see the beach area here, the curvilinear seawall that we designed as part of it, the observation tower coming out over the swimming area. This gives you a great opportunity to be able to observe birds and get up a little bit higher and, and see the park activity as well as the lake activity. You can see the kayak drop-off is coming into the bottom of the frame there as well. You can see we've got some dedicated parking for that. One of the things that we really wanted to do is not build massive parking lots that you had to drive in and circle around for parking. We wanted the parking to feel like a natural part of the park and not like we're paving paradise because it's such a beautiful park and the tree canopy, it would be interrupted if we tried to put in some large parking lots. And here's our uh, remote parking. I mentioned the pond that's existing that we may expand that can be stocked to enhance the fishing opportunities, especially for learn to fish programs. And then we've got another trailhead that can serve. We actually are looking at the trail running along Rummel Road from Chisholm to Lakefront Park. So once you get into Chisholm Park, you can continue on into the park and have additional trailhead opportunities. In, or you can stop at right ad, um, adjacent to Heavenly Hooves. Here's a zoom in on the trailhead that I was just talking about as you get down further south in the park. Um, if someone just wanted to come in and use the trails, we're gonna have a shade pavilion there and some, some parking. Just a real quick update on the trail connection, which is not, that project is not as far advanced as the park project is, but we are looking at the most logical cross sections for connecting the two parks. You can switch. You can see here's the, um, here's the length right now. The section that we're looking at, we've got a drainage swale. Of course, this is a rural cross-section of road. 26-foot travel way, a vegetative buffer, a 10-foot trail, and then another vegetative buffer. All that taking place in the right-of-way. So the cost for all this fun, bottom line, is about um, $5 million. We don't have the cost yet. Again, I said the project for the Trail Connection to Lakefront Park is not as far advanced. So we're looking at this. Um, I know that the city staff is asking this evening for you all to adopt the master plan. One of the advantages, of course, to adopting the master plan is to be able to leverage it for grants. You get higher points with FERDAP and land and water if you have an adopted master plan. And this, of course, can be phased over time. Does anybody have any questions? If you'll... If you'll uh... Stay ready. I'm going to ask the audience if there anyone in the audience that has would like to speak to this item before we turn to our staff. I mean our council. If not, we will entertain questions and a discussion by council. Councilor Martini. Thank you. Um, when this was first presented to the city council, I had a lot of comments and concerns about, um, and maybe my nieces and nephews are are crazy but when I used to take them to the park you know the thing that I always struggled with was like worrying that they were going to get out of the park and get into the traffic you know you can't watch them 360 around and they can get out so then in the new master plan we're basically encircling everything with cars and parking so then that made me more anxious so I know I gave that comment in the last version so what can you detail what's changed between the first time we saw this and Today, like what I can actually, I have it saved on my phone just for that question. <laughs> Let me get it pulled up here for a second. Hold on. And I also wanted to mention that I have Keith Orpeza with me. Keith, 
Um, he's the director of landscape architecture who owns the design. So if we have any design questions on either project, Keith is, Keith is here and able to answer. So it looked like in our agenda package when I was reviewing it, but I didn't have the old plan to compare to the new plan, um, that it looked like things got more spread out into the park, which we had requested in our mm -hmm. last um, review. You know, we said protect the trees. We definitely want to protect the trees. And, you know, but kind of think about with an open mind of, you know, is there ways to reconfigure? So I'd just like, yeah, to kind of go through what changes happened. So, Kelly, could you go back to the plan that had, I'll tell you when. Keep going. That one right there. All right. So uh, we provided for additional boat trailer parking. We relocated the play areas away from the travel lanes. We provided remote parking at the trailhead. Provide additional ball field and associated parking. That's the, um, if you look at the existing, you can see the existing skinned clay in infield. Just south of that is a new, is a new multi-purpose space. Uh, we've respected the battleground. New arrangement allows for vendor and staging areas along the loop road and the remote parking. And that would be down closer to where the pond is. Uh, we've got a total of 163 car parking spaces. We have an additional restroom building to service the new play, play area and the new ball field. So that would be just to the west of the new multipurpose field. And then we have a total of 31 dedicated trailer parking spaces with up to eight more available along the entrance drive. And we reduced the boardwalk at the pond. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I knew the layout was, I liked it better because it was more spread out across the property. And then of course, when you go into, whenever we go into final design, I mean, we can design in gates and fences to kind of enclose the air. That's definitely something that I would be looking for because I just know one person, two kids, you leave with a migraine because you're <laughs> like, <laughs> where are they? Are they running out the backside? And they run where you don't want them to run. So um, I like that. And then I had asked this in my gender review, um, but since we have been getting some traction with our seaplane, um, our seaplane base with, the, with Tallahassee, is there something that we should have incorporated in here as far as the seaplane? Um, the city manager had said that they would incorporate that into the seaplane uh, master plan that's, that's underway, but that was something I was concerned about. Is there any amenities or anything that we needed to do over here to accommodate that in the future? That's it with my questions. I think Ms. Aaron must want to say something. <laughs> Hi, I'm Erin Jenks with the Parks and Recreation Department, and I just wanted to address the concern with the fencing. Um, we, we're looking into the similar fencing that we have at Canary Park on Virginia and 10th Street to add that in that playground area to make sure it's just extra safe for all the kids that are at yeah, play. Yeah, that would be great. Makes it more enjoyable for the adults. <laughs> and then same kind of comment on the ball fields, if we can formalize the, the fencing yeah. along that, because now you're bringing cars a lot closer to, for foul balls. and. Oh, yeah. Any other question? No. Well, actually, Mayor. Yes. Um, I would echo the same with the seaplane. Just make sure that we're covered um, <coughs> for the future. I'd rather put it in design than ask for it later. Any other comment? No. Good. You're looking for an adoption of this plan, are we not? Yes, sir. Yeah. Could I entertain a motion for the adoption of this plan? Motion to approve. I'll get a second. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Askew. Aye. Deputy Mayor Trace. Aye. Councilmember Matheny. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you very much. Excellent. Which brings us to item number two. Madam Clerk, you please read that item. Resolution number 2021-026R, a resolution of the City Council of City of St. Cloud, Florida to accept and adopt the Florida Avenue multi-use trailer trail master plan dated March 2021. Hello. Hello Kristen again, Kayborn Kristen. again, <laughs> Director of Park Planning with GAI's Community Solutions Group. I also have Keith Orpeza, Director of Landscape Architecture here with me to answer design questions. Okay. Um, again, just going through an overview of where, how we got to where we are today. 
We started with online public engagement. In the case of this project, we also did a face-to-face -face public meeting in January, but just a quick overview of the public engagement. And by the way, if you all haven't checked them out, both of these project websites are still up, chismparkplan.com and floridaavenuebikeway.com. Um, check them out. They're, they're really great. There's a lot of really good information on there. We got some interesting comments. People have started to like these. These were really launched at the beginning of COVID, and now they're becoming very typical with all of our projects because even, I think, when COVID is over, we're just going to see the way people participate change drastically. People don't necessarily want to come at night and take time away from their families or Netflix or whatever it may be at the end of the night. They want to just go online and participate at their leisure. No pun intended, of course. <laughs> um, so looking at this, we had 82 responses on the comment plans section. We also had 148 responses on like or dislike. And then at the public meeting, we had comment cards, which we summarized um, and got a lot of written responses. We took a few. Um, we took comments after the meeting as well. So we were able to make sure people who wanted to take them home to have their family members fill them out. We were able to get comments that way. We presented three concept plans. We rolled out all eight feet in its full glory at the, um, at the lakefront building and the second floor when we did the, when we did the meeting, the face-to-face -face meeting. We had our staff there to help go through the different design nuances between the three different concept plans. This is very daunting to look at. This, this is a very long section of road and it's hard um, to look at it in plan view because to me, it looks like a green stripe on a gray photo right now. So we spent a lot of time at that public meeting making sure that we educated people who came out to help them understand. You can see on the left side, we had the typical trail sections that we were looking at or that were possible so we could explain to them the differences. And you can see the red dots and the green dots that um, the people gave us. And concept C was by far the most popular concept and that is a curvilinear trail down the median. Next slide. So no one liked concept A. Keith's feelings were not hurt. It was something we had to look at. Um, the challenge with concept A is there are a lot of driveways on Florida Avenue. And I know that council has expressed some concerns about traversing the trail through intersections. And at intersections, when people are on one of the numbered streets, they're stopping at the stop sign in theory Okay, we realize people don't always, but in theory, they're stopping at the stop sign and looking both ways. So there's more of an opportunity to see a pedestrian coming, especially if it's striped appropriately versus someone backing in and out of their driveway, which might not happen as often as the travel at an intersection, but it still is, there's many more potential conflicts. Concept B was um, really just running straight down the median, and then concept C, the most popular one, was the curvilinear trail down the median. We also showed some plant material, um, different types of trees. There are some beautiful trees on Florida Avenue right now, and people are, we understand the public are very attached to the trees. Some of them are very near to the end of their useful life, um, and they will be, um, they're not contributing to the canopy as much as we would like, so it's important to refresh the, the, refresh the canopy over time. So we wanted to show photographs of what people might like to see as we enhance that beautiful canopy over time. So we showed different trees, we showed different understory, um, a lot of native vegetation, things that will do well in the condition of the median of a road and got some feedback on that. So you can see um, people really love their existing live oaks. People like the idea of crepe myrtles, some new live oaks, palm trees to a certain extent, but um, the live oaks and the crepe myrtles by far were the most popular. So the final master plan for the multi-use trail. We, here is the full length master plan and then the section, and I apologize, there's no way I can read those, the um, dimensions of the section there. But we've got the, the trail going down the median and we have looked at parking on 10th Street. I think the next slide probably has, there we go. We've got the parking solution um, enlargement here at 9th and 10th Street. There were some concerns with that and how that would be integrated, so we've, took an extra extra look at that, and that's it. This time we have some 
responses from the public. If you'll stick around, I'm sure the council may have some questions. Uh, I believe there's two items of record that were mailed in. Could you read those letters that uh, into the record? I have a letter for, from St. Cloud Main Street to the St. Cloud City Council. Please accept this letter of support for the Parks and Recreation Project of the Florida Avenue Multipurpose Trail as a longtime goal of Main Street to have a bike path that brought people to the downtown corridor. We fully appreciate the efforts to move this forward. Also, among the goals is the mobility of our citizens and visitors. The project fully supports both of these efforts. Our board had much discussion in reference to the options workshop and will support the majority of the citizens option of plan three. However, there was also a significant support for option two. We would look forward to seeing this project come to fruition and have an op additional element to the community and healthier lifestyles, beautification of the community, connectivity, mobility, and economic development. Thank you, Paula Star Stark, Executive Director. Thank you. The next letter we have is from a citizen, dear mayor and city council members. Unfortunately, I am unable to attend the city council meeting in person on March 25th, 2021 to speak in support of the Florida Avenue multi-trail project. My husband and I did attend the come and go public workshop scheduled on January 5th, 2021 and provided our comments on the options presented and the project itself. I have been a resident of the city of St. Cloud for approximately 25 years. As a resident with young children back then, I always enjoyed the opportunities offered by the city to its residents, whether it was the activities and classes offered by the Parks and Recreation Department, the Chamber of Commerce, or Main Street. These outlets provided the residents of St. Cloud the chance to get to know the town and their neighbors. The lakefront played an important part in the equation and does so even more now. This project will connect the lakefront to downtown and beyond, in addition to addressing safety aspects and access for all. Now in retirement, my husband and I, along with our friends, are frequent visitors to the lakefront. It is the link that brings groups and families together. Adding Florida Avenue to the mix not only enhances the quality of time our residents will spend outside, but also beautifies the area, similar to the enhancements made to Dakota Avenue years back. The current environment has redefined how people spend their time by reintroducing them to outside activities. Now is the time for this council to meet the demand for open green space for its residents. Thank you, Daisy Snyder, 4912 Zion Drive, St. Cloud, Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Dirk Webb, you have requested to speak to this item. Please step forward, share your name again and your affiliation and address. Good evening, Dirk Webb, President and CEO of the St. Cloud Chamber of Commerce. Please forgive my casual appearance tonight uh, as President of the Chamber. I mean, no disrespect to the Council or to the Mayor. <laughs> uh, the St. Cloud Chamber of Commerce has been and continues to be a proponent of active planning for continued growth of our community, especially when using our natural assets. Our Lakeshore area is, of course, the centerpiece of our center place, as the new logo describes. So, too, is our newly renovated and burgeoning downtown business and entertainment district. Recently, visitors from Michigan and New York stopped by the chamber and asked what they should see in the downtown area. I started to describe some places they should visit. Then I stopped myself and said, it's a beautiful Central Florida afternoon. Let's go take a walk. Their reply was, how cool we get to see the downtown with the chamber president. Well, we looked at murals, architecture, and history for about a half hour or so. Then my visitor said, we're hungry. We'd really like some seafood, and we've heard about your lake. What do you suggest? I, of course, directed them to the lakefront and Krabby Bills. As we were parting, I said, get a table outside. You won't be sorry. It occurred to me walking back to the chamber that this scenario was likely to be happening with increasing velocity as St. Cloud continues to grow. We have an opportunity for seaplane, for seaplane traffic at the lakefront. At the same time, downtown is coming alive with activities. None of that is coincidence, but the residue of planning, planning, and more planning. 
It is important, in my opinion, to link these two wonderful community assets. Just landing a seaplane here is nice, but to get from the marina and lakefront via a bikeway would be an even more vibrant experience. I can imagine a party touching gracefully down on shimmering waters of the lake, perhaps renting a bicycle for a short ride up Florida Avenue, stopping along New York Avenue, getting lunch at one of our downtown restaurants, enjoying the murals, the historical markers, and the friendliness that makes St. Cloud so special. And then I could see them pedaling back to the lakefront, sipping an iced tea, or watching a dazzling Central Florida evening fade away just as the moment they were skimming the water yet toward wherever home might be. I can see similar experiences for our residents. We all see them at any time of the day, walking, biking, or simply enjoying being outside, which I'm finding is one of the most charming points of Florida living. We have these important assets that are available to us. Our lakefront and our downtown will soon be destinations of choice. We should be a destination of choice because of our stunning lakefront. We should be a destination of choice driving commerce to our unique downtown district. We should be the destination of choice and your chamber supports this effort. Thank you. You make me want to go down the lakefront. So. <laughs> Maybe we need to adjourn and <laughs> finish our meeting down there. Thank you so much, Mr. Webb. Terry Park. Terry Park, 909 Illinois Avenue, St. Cloud. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I am actually here representing um, the Church of Christ congregation whose building is on the corner of Florida and Ninth. Um, in the past, our little congregation made three attempts to obtain approval to pave the area in front of our building between the sidewalk and the street. We were refused with no explanation, even though the apartment buildings next to our building has been paved out front for many years. Shortly after our request, the street parking area across the street from our building was improved with brick pavers, planters, and beautiful landscaping for the businesses on the corner of Florida and 10th Street. When this change was made, I met with Dave Askew to request his insistence in learning why our request for paving that small area in front of our building had been denied. And this is when he shared with me the proposed plan that is under consideration tonight. And he advised that the plan, though, has two options for the area in front of our building. One includes street parking spaces and one does not. Our little congregation has been there since the 1950s and we've always had street parking in front of our building. I was just, I'm coming tonight to find out which option is going to be approved tonight to ensure that we can keep our parking in front of our building with at least one handicapped space as there is there currently. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we need anyone to speak to that? Mm. I'm going to wait till the rest of your public yes. comment and then yes. maybe, okay. maybe they can come back and explain. All right, if you keep that in mind. Mr. Rollis. John Rollis. Your turn. John? John Rollis. John Rollis, that's what I said. Come on up. Get hard of hearing. I'm sorry. I'll need to speak a little louder. Good to see you, John. Good to see you, too, all of you. It reminds me of 20 some years ago I was sitting up there. <laughs> I live on Florida Avenue, up 50 plus years. Been a great place, really enjoyed it. And you know, the city has grown, has grown left and right. And we got now a lot of traffic on Florida Avenue because of the lakefront, the beach, the boat basin, the crabby bills, and more coming. And we're really concerned about the traffic on Florida Avenue more than, uh, than normal because our older residents either died or are gone and younger ones are coming in with their children. I don't know why we can't get some speed bumps to slow that down. Uh, there's just too much traffic going down that street. I know when I leave at about 9th Street and head towards the lakefront, boy, you want to feel like you can go 100 miles an hour. Feels good. 
but we need the cowboys stopped, and we need because we don't want to do it until at the cost of a, a child being killed. You know, it's very important. We shouldn't have to wait before something happens. Let's do it now. Well, you guys need to take that. Let's see. Uh, well, down the lakefront, you know, we need more picnic areas. And uh, one little complaint, when you do some work on a road, especially Ford Avenue, we still got some barricades sitting on one of the mediums. Why? And then they do their all. There's more work to be done, doesn't look like it. But sitting there too long. You need to probably check that out. Um, like I said, I've been, uh, my home was built back in 1936. Four story, uh, four bedroom, two story. It even has a lifetime roof made out of asbestos shingles. Still the same roof. Isn't that something? I've been, we've been at that by a new one. Uh, so we got antiquity sitting on Ford Avenue. Uh, next door used to be the banker of St. Cloud. Cross Street was an op optometrist. Uh, uh, we had a couple lawyers. In fact, I think the previous owner of my home was a judge, a lawyer, and then a judge, Alex Hall, as I recall. So I'm, I'm recommending that the Plan C have a called the Florida St. Cloud Florida Trail. I'd like to see that. Not concrete down the center, bricks and leave some of the trees alone, zigzag around them, put some benches down there, and dress up the medium with shrubs and flowers. Make it very presentable because it is a an opening card to our lakefront and to our community. You know, the friendly soldier city, is that what we call it? And I made sure that stayed when I was on city council. Uh, oh, you know, down to the lakefront with that, the, when that lake bike path was put in, it was great. But I go down there and I travel the lake, lake shore. Do you realize how many people are using bicycles down there? Zero. You can count them on your fingers. They're walking. They're walking their dogs. They're having a great time. So we want to make sure Florida Avenue, it's the St. Cloud Florida Avenue Trail. I think that would be a really great an asset to our community. That's all I got. Don't Thank forget. you, John. You're welcome. Thank I'll, you very much. I don't charge much for all that. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> Would anyone else in the audience like to speak to item number two? If not, we'll have discussion and or motion by council at this time. First of all, do you would have you like any me to address their questions? questions? Yes, yes, you will. Please yep. address that question that was raised. Absolutely. Kelly, would you flip back to the enlargement? Oh, one more. One more. There you go. Um, I'm not, ma'am, I'm not sure where your church is, but we are. We do have parallel parking there. Do you? Can you see where it is, or does somebody know where her church is between 9th and 10th? The top top right corner. Okay, so there's parking. Mayor, Mayor, if she's going to. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Go ahead. She wanted to confirm it, um, so yes, I'm confirming it for her. We did, this is one of the changes we've made since the last time we presented. So this is the enlargement of that area, and there is parking in front of her church. Good. One comment more. was a handicap space, though. I don't think there's any handicap. Provided. And that that could be addressed when the project got into engineering okay. without an issue. Okay. And then um, to address the other questions, the path absolutely will curve <coughs> to avoid um, existing trees that still have are contributing to the canopy. And we are showing amenities all along there. You can see there's some pedestrian scale lighting benches, really a nice a nice median. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have any questions from council? Councilmember Matheny. Thank you. Um, I, I have the same comments I had last time uh, on this. Thank you for doing the presentation when it was brought the last time to us. Didn't include the presentation, which I, I thought we needed. But I agree that Florida Avenue is a beautiful street. I love it. It's one of my favorite streets in, in the city. Um, 
I do think that it's been a little neglected um, with respect to the tree canopy and, you know, and like you said, trees age out. I live in a community that has gorgeous, huge trees, but no one's been planting trees. <laughs> and so it's like the trees keep coming down and you're just like, oh, there's this hole now. So, um, you know, I also think that it's a great um, thing for us to have trails. I love trails. I think, um, you know, I know one of our economic development um, directives was to create a trail that connects between the lakeshore and downtown. I think I agree with all those. I just don't know that I agree that Florida is the right street for this to be on. Um, I think we should enhance Florida. It's already a great street. It's already got great bones. It's already got, you know, the foundation for um, great landscaping. We just need to do a little tweaking. Like, personally, I would like to leave Florida alone and then maybe move the trail one street over to Ohio. Um, you know, I, and I mentioned this in the last meeting, but I don't think you were there because we didn't have a presentation. But, you know, I go, I used to go to the lakefront all the time in the morning, and there's just so many people trying to cross the road. There's a lot of activity right at um, Florida and Lakeshore. Like, there's already so much stuff, people <laughs> trying to cross, people trying to go into the parking lot, people trying to be on the trail, that I'm just worried about adding more potential conflicts there. And then another issue I have is, I don't like the trail down the middle of the road. I'm concerned, yeah, yes, the cars on the side streets will stop, but I don't think they're gonna be looking for a via, um, pedestrians or bikes in the median. So um, those are just kind of my comments. I, I mean, I love the trail, the connection. You know, I love everything about it. I just think it's the wrong street. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Trace, Council Member Trace. Um, so, I, what does the typical signage look like for the, the trail kind of going in the median? Now we'll have turning movements of, of cars trying to turn kind of that are going parallel with, with bicycle traffic. And then currently all of those, I believe all of them are stop signs mm -hmm. on, on the cross street. So can you kind of talk through that a little bit? Yeah, and the signage will be worked out as the plan moves into, if it does move forward into, into final design. but. Um, where there are busier streets, it could be flashing crosswalks that you're starting to see come. I, I mean, it will take a little bit of time for people to get used to, but you all live in a traditional grid, which is great for a lot of reasons, but that's going to be a challenge no matter where you put the, where you put the trail. Yeah, I mean, it took, took me a long time to remember that the, the new light that, or the new uh, stop sign that was put mm -hmm. on in Florida to make sure to stop that before you uh, keep going through it. Um, Hardscape and benches, is, is that a plan along? Absolutely, okay. yes. Perfect. We want it to be an experience, not just a way for somebody to get from point A to point B. So think about Dakota and what you have on Dakota with benches and the trees providing a lot of nice opportunity for natural shade. When we have our most beautiful weather here in the winter in Florida, when it gets dark at 530, we have pedestrian scale lighting along the trail. So that'll encourage people to continue to use it even in our in our most wonderful time of year that's dark. <laughs> okay, good. So it wouldn't be lights that just kind of shade up, you know, are yeah. in the canopy and then, you know, you end up having to trim trees to have lighting. Right. We're going to have lower lighting. Perfect. Yes. Um, and then we, we had a lot of discussion about um, kind of the south end of it. On the north end, what's the idea for connecting it to uh, the Lakefront Park on the other side of uh, Lakeshore? That would probably, I mean, that will be another, that will be another crosswalk, but that will obviously, that's where you have the most traffic probably like, with the exception of what's going on at 10th. So again, that would be developed as part of the, as the final design. This is still concept level, mm -hmm. but it would definitely be, I mean, you would probably want to look at a traffic study and then are you table topping it? Are you just doing a flashing beacon? We don't know the answer to that right now. It can be somewhere. whatever you want it to be, really. <laughs> do we do we discuss having a four-way stop there? Because I know we all talk about the folks going 40 miles an hour down down Lakeshore, and now there's actually a, an enforceable stop sign there. Uh, I mean, we'll put road spikes if you want them. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> People have run flat tires now. It doesn't yeah. work. Yeah, once they get one, they'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I personally like if we can keep the tree canopy and meander this in the right way through... Uh, through the media, and I think it's a, a, a great option. So I'm in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, like, I like it all. I even like that um, 
Mr. Trace brought up the stop sign because that was what I was going to talk about. But the only thing that's um, it gets a little confusing once you get past 10th Street. I'm not sure. I, I think who designed it maybe didn't really figure out how to get them to, to turn right to go into the downtown because it just seems like we're going to head right down to the high school with this thing and cross. Well, the original design has us crossing over 192. I really don't see that happening. Um, so if, and when we're starting to build this thing, if there's some concept in there that, you know, you great designers have to get them to take a right into the downtown, that would right. be fantastic. But I'm a supporter of this and saving as many trees as possible. It would be uh, super kudos for me. Well, I, I certainly understand Councilman Matheny's uh, recommendation for Ohio. I, I drove down several times just to take another look at it. I certainly prefer the Florida Avenue. Uh, more of the houses have been restored. It's uh, more of a historic look from more of the houses. The fact that it's closer to the downtown. Uh, the canopy that's already there that could certainly be enhanced and probably needs to be addressed. Uh, it's already um, uh, one of the streets that, you know, for me is historic and has a lot of appeal, and I'm certainly supportive of, of uh, moving forward with this recommendation going down Florida Avenue. Are there any other questions or discussions? Could I entertain a motion? Motion, motion to, to adopt approve. resolution 2021-26-R. Second. We have a motion for adoption by Council Member Trace, second by Council Member Askew. Madam Clerk. Deputy Mayor Trace. Aye. Council Member Matheny. No. Council Member Askew. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries three to one. Thank you for letting us be here and spend so much time with you this evening. Thank you very much Stay for safe. all the work Thanks. that you've done and that you will be doing. Brings us to item number three and uh, thank all of you for your participation. Madam Clerk, will you read item number three? Resolution number 2021-053-R, a resolution of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, adopt, updating the City's organizational values, strategic goal statements, and the addition of strategic objectives as developed during the January 2021 Council Strategic Planning Workshop. Good evening. Abismael Abreu, Business Navigator. And I am here to present Resolution 2021-053-R. Can you guys hear me okay? Good. Uh, so resolution number 2021-053-R, it's uh, proposing updates to the city organizational values, strategic goal statements, and the additional strategic objectives as developed during the uh, January 2021 strategic workshop by the city council. During this strategic workshop, uh, the city, city staff and city council work on rewording the growth management, the infrastructure, the public service, and the professional workforce goal statements, the addition of a strategic objective underneath each objective, uh, sorry, uh, strategic goal, and the introduction of key performance indicator as I mentioned to report the progress on this strategic plan. Next slide, please. So starting off with our organizational values, it was recommended the addition of the word teamwork under the economic development goal, there's no proposed changes to the actual language of the goal statement. Uh, however, there was an addition of three strategic objectives underneath. Of growth management, it's proposed to update the strategic statement to read, to create a vibrant, progressive, and diverse community through sustainable planning for all generations, as well as the addition of four strategic objectives. Under the infrastructure goal, uh, the city is proposing the updating to provide safe, sustainable, and, re and resilient infrastructure for the community, as well as three strategic objectives. There's no proposed changes to the financial sustainability. However, there's a, an addition of three strategic objectives underneath. Under the public service, there is Actually, it's supposed to say that there's a, a change on, the, on that one, and I'm going to read it here for the record. So it is to provide an effective high level of service to all internal and external customers, as how, as how it's proposed to be changed, and as well as the uh, additional three strategic objectives. 
And lastly, under the professional workforce, uh, we're proposing the change of the language to read, to develop and retain qualified talent based on the city's core values to provide exceptional services to the community, as well as the addition of three strategic objectives. Uh, staff recommends approval of resolution 2021-053R, and we are here in person requesting that the city council also uh, approves the resolution as, as read. I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak to this item? If not, we'll have discussion and or motion by council. Motion to approve. We have a motion from Councilmember Matheny, a second from me, the mayor. Sorry, I do have some comments. Okay, you may ask for a comment. Um, a lot of them, so we're adopting the ob objectives that were in here, but they weren't really discussed. Correct, okay. yes. Under the resolution, you have the organizational values, the strategic goals, and the objectives. Okay, so um, I'll just go through my specific comments. Under public service, um, the, the two objectives, the first two, 5.1 and 5.2, are essentially the same. Um, so I just kind of want that looked at. I don't know who from staff is on that one. We can, uh, if, uh, are you looking for something different in terms of, that doesn't have to deal with technology uh, or more? I mean, it's, a, it's incorporate industry best practices and innovative technologies to effectively deliver the highest level of service. And the next one is incorporate proven and innovative processes, resources, technology to enhance effectiveness, efficiency, and consistency. They're kind of the same thing, just a bunch of words. It's not enough they could be incorporated together. That's something that we can work on, correct? Okay. So and, just and I'm fine, like this being adopted in substantial form and then it's, um, and then under public service for the, I, I don't know if it's goal statement, to provide an effective high level of service. I think it should just be to provide a high level of service effective and high level are kind of redundant. And then under professional workforce, it just seemed a little wordy with the, with the changes. How would you like to proceed on the professional? I mean, it's to develop and retain. I mean, that's all fine. It just was kind of lengthy. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back and refine that, Mr. Trace. Okay. And, and, and it doesn't, I mean, it's... I understand what you're saying. It's fine. And some we'll wordsmith it a little bit more and come back uh, with your comments. If there's no okay. objection for other council members, I don't see any, so we'll, we'll be glad to do that. And then we're not a, we're not adopting the KPIs right now. That was just kind of for our information. Correct. The, the KPIs, um, they're not part of the resolution, Correct. but they come hand in hand. That's how we'll report. Okay. Um, I, I can just, withdraw my motion if you want. Mr. Manzaris, do we need we, we could table it. We can we can modify the motion. I mean, it's well, I'd like I, to have it start. It's not an emergency though. Like, let's clean up the language. I I would say before. Well, I understood Mr. Trace's comments, but I also understood him saying he's fine with it moving forward with just some Modification. some some yeah. words. It's wordsmithing. I mean, the big basically. the big picture is there. It's it's great. So, I just want to make sure. So I don't think he's. Do you have anything else? Um, I want to see a little more. Um, meet to the KPIs uh, under infrastructure. I'm just making sure we're we're moving in the right direction on on other aspects, not just the the couple that are mentioned here. Yes, and just to provide you some more information on the KPIs uh, under infrastructure, I am working with the utilities department to give you more of the water. So I believe you asked for that. Uh, right now, we added. Uh, percentage of wastewater received sent out as reused water as a KPI that wasn't previously there uh, at the time of the workshop. And I'm currently working with uh, Marjorie and her team to provide you with more as well as we, uh, okay. as we speak. Because so. it seems like a lot of our discussions are about infrastructure, and that was like the lightest section of KPIs. So I just want to make sure we're, we're at least looking at uh, other opportunities to add some KPIs in there to make sure we're on the right track. Perfect. That's it. Sorry. So to clarify, Mr. Trace, are you okay with the motion as it is with work with some wordsmithing work on the items that you just pointed out? Yeah. I mean, as long as you are fine I'm modifying the motion for that. I don't think we need to modify the motion. Just be included in. 
just be this included. includes the changes that Mr. Right. Okay. Uh, Councilor Rasky has addressed. A motion to approve with the comments that Mr. Trace gave. And I've seconded it. Okay, perfect. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Matheny. Aye. Councilmember Askew. Aye. Deputy Mayor Trace. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brings us to item number four. Clerk. Discussion of possible action regarding appointment to vacancy on the Economic Development Advisory Committee. Mayor, at this time there's a vacancy at seat six, which is an at-large appointment. I do want to mention that we, since we published this agenda, we did get a resignation from seat five of William Underley also. So we so, have two vacant. So we have two vacancies. Seat five and seat six. Mr. Trace, I believe... Traditionally, we've appointed those by seats. Yes. Uh, so on seat five, um, I just want to thank Mr. Underley. I think he served on that committee for six or eight years. Yes. Um, thank him for his service uh, to the city and on EDAC. And then I would like to um, appoint Colby Urban to EDAC for seat five. Okay. Seat number six. Is it vacant? I'd like to recommend Maureen McNamee Cook. Okay. She's requested reappointment. Are there any other nominations? All right. I'd like to make uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, those two appointments to EDAC. Second. And a second. I have a motion from Council Member Trace. <laughs> Trace. My mind went blank. I was thinking about Mr. Askew. <laughs> and a second from Council Member Askew. Madam Clerk, we call the roll. Council Member Askew. Aye. Deputy Mayor Trace. Aye. Council Member Matheny. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. <laughs> Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Do you have anything else for us? No, sir. Okay. That brings us to a add-on item, number five, resolution number 2021-059R. Would you please read that? Mayor, point yes. of order. I, I believe that there could be some applicants in the audience for item B that was pulled. And I apologize for not making that clear. We off the consent agenda. We yes. believe that there's still people here for that item. If you're here for item B, that item has been pulled. And if there's anyone here that uh, we're wanting to speak to the item of preserve at Lakeside preliminary subdivision plan that has been pulled uh, earlier in the meeting and so uh, it will not be addressed this afternoon. And was that at the request of the applicant or no, was that? No, it was request of staff. Okay. Okay. Based on the review, we had additional questions that weren't answered after briefing. All right. I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear earlier. If that's... I just thought we were going to discuss it, so. Okay. Thank you, sir. Could you share item number five, please? Resolution number 2021-059-R, a resolution of the City of St. Cloud approving a settlement agreement with the Department of Environmental Protection, St. John's Water Management District, South Florida Water Management District, Southwest Florida Water Management District related to the challenges and proposed Florida Administrative Code rules impacting the Central Florida Water Initiative area and authorize the mayor to execute all necessary documents to complete the settlement and provide an effective date. Good evening. Uh, slide presentation. Uh, Marjorie Craig, Environmental Utilities Director. So the Florida Department of Environmental Protection proposed the final Central Florida Water Initiative rule on November 19th of uh, last year and uh, that started off the final adoption process. So they had initiated it uh, in February of, of 2020. Uh, many times that adoption process goes on uh, much longer, but they uh, unexpectedly submitted uh, the draft rule to the legislature and began, um, they cut short any changes that could be made. So while St. Cloud very strongly supports the environmental goals by FDEP. 
that are reflected in the in the even the initial rule, we had some concerns about it. That that draft rule would have cut our allocation without consideration of previous mitigation or demonstrated harm, and we were expected to be cut by 1.4 million gallons per day in our permit allocation. So the replacement of that uh, water that would be lost would be about 18 to 21 million dollars. I don't know, my voice is cracking here. So this is just a map that kind of shows you where St. Cloud is in relation to uh, the regional harm. And St. Cloud itself, and I don't know if this clicker works, the original slide had a little star where St. Cloud is, which is right here. So it's not near the other regions, the Lake Wells Ridge, um, Wakiva Springs. It's, it really doesn't have the same level of, uh, it's not near any of the areas of concern. Next slide. So with your approval, we engaged outside counsel to develop a petition and submit it. And by March 1st, there were 10 public water suppliers that had submitted petitions to challenge the rule. And five entities had entered as interveners. So the matter was referred to DOA and it was signed a judge, and they scheduled hearings for March 29th through the 30th. And the petitioners uh, and, and the regulatory agencies started negotiations and discussions to uh, a settlement agreement. And we reached one on March 19th. So the really good news is that this draft rule, which we, again, support in concept, it's been modified so that nothing shall be immediately uh, construed to adjust any of the existing permits. They'll not be modified or considered modified and excused from the 2025 demand limits for previously addressed water resources impacts. And that demand limit's no longer mandatory. So the burden's on the water management district to show that the resources have been impacted either individually or cumulatively. Uh, and new groundwater withdrawals can be granted if there are demonstrated offsets, such as reuse, recharge. Uh, and there is also a component for a per capita or per person water use and water conservation. And we believe that with our uh, strong water conservation efforts and our planned ones that we will we'll meet that. Next slide. So we recommend on, on that basis to approve the resolution. It's protective of the new rule, is protective of the environment and equitable. And I guess I've never worn suspenders, so, so when they said belt and suspenders, it's actually a double protection. So um, I had to ask my husband, what does that mean? <laughs> so all 19 parties have agreed to sign the settlement agreement. And St. Cloud is the best and the last one to sign it, if you guys approve it, assuming you guys approve it. And so I'm going to be taking a picture of the signature page and sending it forward if you guys sign it. And we, uh, there is no companion house bill yet, but we're hopeful that that will happen. And then questions? <clears throat> Again, my voice is just cracking. I apologize. First of all, would anyone in the audience like to speak to this item? If not, we will have discussion, questions, and a motion by council. Council Member Matheny. Thank you. I just want to um, thank everybody for protecting the entitlement that the city had. This was a big, 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 big deal. Big deal. So thank you for that. And I'm really shocked, personally, like how quick this came to fruition. So we must have had a Cracker Jack team for sure. So thank you. Thank you so much. As a resident, I, I, I said before, I'm, I'm so proud of the team and the hard work and your support. This has been wonderful. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how you get 20 people to agree to the same thing, but yeah, kudos. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Anyone else? No. Fantastic. Motion I'll make a motion for the adoption of resolution 2021-059R. Do I have a second? Second. second. I have a second from Councilmember Matheny. <clears throat> Madam Clerk. Councilmember Askew. Aye. Deputy Mayor Trace. Aye. 
Councilmember Matheny? Aye. Mayor Blackwell? <clears throat> Aye. Motion carries 4 0. And Ms. Craig, thank you for all of your hard work and your team and your staff. Uh, this was a very important issue. Mr. Manzaris. I do not have anything, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right. Mr. City Manager. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I have uh, Police Chief Pete Gollett here is going to give us an update on traffic enforcement in the city of St. Cloud. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Sturgeon. Council, Pete Gauntlet, Chief of Police Public Safety Administrator. Mr. Sturgeon had approached me recently to talk a little bit about traffic, and there were some questions about traffic enforcement and data. Ironically, the sergeant in the room, Jonathan Colley, spent the majority of his career in our traffic unit and can certainly attest to pretty much everything that I'm saying. Let me give you a brief synopsis. Our agency is probably one of the, the foremost agencies as far as our enforcement efforts and our statistics that, that I'll provide to you. From December to January of last year, um, nearly 10,000 traffic contacts, traffic stops were conducted. 9,173 were documented and a number of additional ones um, that don't go documented only because they happen to be happenstance. They're stopping or talking to somebody at the same time. Of those traffic contacts, about 5,700 citations were issued. Officers have complete discretion. And I think in the tough times in the COVID uh, era that we're in, officers have a lot more uh, discretion than ever because times are tight. People are, don't have the financial means and to stroke somebody for a $168 ticket sometimes is devastating to them, whereas a good, good old-fashioned counseling works on, um, a much better. At the same time, our statistics also talk about we did um, about 1,131 traffic investigations, which is a lot of crashes, and that's one of the impacts that we have in the community is the design of our roads, particularly 13th Street, which Physically, we can do nothing with because it's all the state streets, and unfortunately, there's a right, lot of right-hand turns and left-hand turns in violation of right-of-ways and whatnot that impact those on a routine basis. Um, this month alone, so far this month, I think we've had some 560-some traffic contacts in, in, in a three-week period. Uh, when we do the numbers, on an average, I'll give you a little breakdown. On an average on Sunday, we average about 78 tickets or 78 contacts, I'm sorry, um, 181 on Mondays, 164 on Tuesdays, 161 on Wednesdays, 163 on Thursdays. Friday, we get a little busier at about 225, and 159 um, contacts are on average made. But more importantly, it's the prevention and the efforts that we do. We're very much a part of the Osceola County uh, Community Safety Team, and that's comprised of all of our uh, our peers as well as our traffic engineer partners within the state of Florida and the county as well as our own. Uh, prevention, engineering, enforcement, aggressive driving campaigns, uh, DUI campaigns and blitzes, pedestrian campaigns, a lot of child safety issues in this, <clears throat> those areas. At the same time, we do have, as you know, we have a limited number of traffic officers. And uh, that's one thing that we have addressed and certainly city manager is well aware now that in, the, in upcoming years to come we do need to in, expand that unit to have more capacity because with a small unit along with our patrol officers they're also responsible for the crash investigations and traffic homicide investigations which are very lengthy and very time consuming as far as their investigative efforts are go they wear a lot of hats they coordinate all of our covid responses a lot of our special events a lot of our traffic details and many, many efforts that go into our community. Today, I was happy to announce that we hosted the Florida Department of Transportation officials into our new crime center. And uh, they were so impressed that they are working with us diligently to give us complete access to all of the DOT camera systems that will go that, that uh, dot 192, which we're very excited to be able to have because it will also help our enforcement as well as our ability to, uh, to monitor traffic. We continue to do the traffic monitoring and the traffic speed analysis on various roadways. Lakeshore continues and always will be a discussion, but I can assure you that our numbers there will continue. We spend more time on Lakeshore than probably any roadway in this city. 
um, on average, the, the, the median speed is still in the 25 to 30 mile an hour range. Doesn't take away the fact that on occasion there is somebody that's exceeding the speed limit and we deal with them uh, as necessary and certainly do those enforcement efforts upon uh, catching people that are, that are speeding. And we've had a, a several incidents in town. We've had some serious crashes and a fatality and some of those involved pedestrians and one particular case was a bicyclist that was trying to cross 13th Street and just didn't see the cars coming. Unfortunately, was was struck and killed. But um, we continue to do our enforcement efforts, and uh, I'm very confident as we move forward with the numbers that we're, we're presenting. And on average, um, we're going to continue to keep those enforcement efforts up across the board. Traffic safety is paramount to any community within the, the not only the major roadways, but within our residential areas as well. Well, we certainly appreciate the incredible work that you guys do. I don't know how you keep up with what you keep up with now, you know, but uh, I'm sure uh, the other council members probably get just as many complaints as I do. Most of them are about, you know, Lakeshore is one of the main areas I get regular complaints on. We don't have a lot of east to west th <clears throat> thoroughfares. Yeah. And unfortunately, Lakeshore being what it is has become a thoroughfare. It's like a and bypass. It is. And we are always open, but as you know, when you start looking at speed tables and calming devices, there's a sidetrack to that. And because they can be noisy, they can create a traffic hazard. Their, the fire department will tell you, as the city manager's former um, career in the fire service, fire paramedics don't like speed tables for the very simple reason that they jar fire trucks and they jar patients and everything else and ambulances as they transport. But um, it, became, it continues to be a challenge in, in with some of the roadways, and it's just the fact that we don't have a lot of thoroughfares, so there's not a lot of options, and the traffic volume is something that we, we do keep and monitor on a routine basis. Has there been any kind of uh, evaluation on the additional crosswalks and lights and things that have been added on Lake Shore as to whether or not those have been effective, helped? When you do look at them, they're going to have a positive effect because the signage is brighter. They're much more noted than they were before. There's been discussion by several local residents that have expressed a desire to put stop signs in some of those. The problem is the stop signs aren't warranted and authorized by the state of Florida to be traffic speed devices, and that's oftentimes why they're put there. People want to think it's going to slow traffic down, but in reality what happens is that those same people, if you're not careful, are starting to run those stop signs, and they become a problem. And um, the volume of traffic from the side streets and the state streets onto Lake Shore isn't substantial enough, in my opinion, to uh, to warrant stop signs in those areas, unless that volume picks up. Something like Florida Avenue, if that was to be, that may be something that will, will be considered certainly because safety will be an issue there, if the if the Florida Trail is in fact put in place. Has the issue of texting and driving been reduced, or does that continue to just be a problem? It's always going to be a problem. It's been one of our biggest problems throughout the community and in, in every community. And um, there's a lot of legislative requests by the Florida police chiefs and whatnot to enhance some of those penalties and whatnot, but uh, we'll see what happens in Tallahassee. All right. Councilmember Matheny. Thank you. This was actually something that I brought up in the workshop. I'm sure uh, that um, the city manager had told you that. And my intention was not to say that St. Cloud PD wasn't doing their job. I know you guys do a fantastic job. It was just, what can we do? You know, we all see it on the state streets and the lake shore, but you see it on the state streets too. I'll stand at my boyfriend's house and just watch cars fly by. I stand at my best friend's house and watch cars fly. By. I mean, and when they go by and they're speeding, they're speeding, they're going like 50 miles an hour. So, you know, it was more like, I understand we're doing a lot, but is there, I mean, do you have any advice or suggestions of things we could do differently, better? I mean, to me, it seems like enforcement is what we need. Um, and, and I totally agree with COVID. And, you know, I know it would be a tough pill to swallow for people to get a $200 ticket or $160 ticket. I get that. But I think also getting pulled over <laughs> and getting counseled would maybe start telling, you know, like the feeling would start be out there. Don't speed down the state streets because, you know, you're going to get... Um, a little conversation with St. Cloud PD. So do you have any suggestions of things we could do better to? We will continue to do public 
service announcements to try to enhance that and not to say oftentimes when we get into a residential area and start doing traffic enforcement as Jonathan will tell you more times than not it's the very residents of the street that we're enforcing on that we're stopping and enforcing <laughs> and um, yeah. it gets their attention quickly and if it's blatant they'll be cited there's no question yeah. about that and when complaints do come in we'll we'll address them immediately so if you have any particular streets or times of the day let us know send okay. us and and we'll we'll address it accordingly so <clears throat> absolutely yeah and so i when i had brought it up i did ask the council you know like if if you guys were able to do more enforcement that certainly we would need to support stand in full support behind st cloud pd to make sure that you know if you started getting pressure that we didn't cave on on <laughs> on the enforcement so i appreciate everything you guys do i know you're um my comment wasn't to insinuate that you weren't doing any you know all that you sure. could do it was more just like is there anything else we can do like you know i mean it's just we just see it every day you just see the aggressive driving and and you're right like everybody's driving normal and then there's one car zipping in and out of everybody and you know that's the one that's going to cause the accident and we will continue to work it very thoroughly and without without delay and that's the key to it is addressing some of those neighborhood complaints as we are able to and certainly on some of those streets so um the the nature is there's those old streets people are become very accustomed to mm -hmm. and we have some young people that don't drive appropriately and they'll, they'll certainly be dealt with as as needed so um, we get general complaints that come into my office about our, our enforcement efforts are usually people that have been cited mm -hmm. that caused an accident they're debating us on the, the, their guilt or not guilt which has to go obviously to sure. a traffic hearing officer to deal with but uh Traffic is a difficult process, and we're 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 overloaded because our streets are crowded, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of traffic that wasn't there 10 years ago, sure. or 20 years ago. So yeah, and I think people like get frustrated on 192, and so they're like, I'm going to cut down to the lakefront, and then they sure haul boogie down the state streets, and you're just like, I guess I've gotten to the age where I'm just like, slow down. There's children. There's animals. That's <laughs> right. Know? Exactly. I'm hollering at people on the streets. Like I've become that person. Exactly. So. What are some of the pros and cons and even the legalities of cameras, traffic cameras? Uh, is that awesome? I sound probably a whole bag of worms. Is it the, the red light running cameras is a whole big bag of worms. And I can tell you that you, in order to, for me to support traffic red light running cameras, you would have to show substantial crash data to justify it. Unfortunately, what's happened over many years is many cities implemented them candidly as a revenue generating source for those cities and not particularly <laughs> necessary based on the crash criteria. And it becomes very problematic. And believe it or not, the average traffic citation that we write, the city generates very little revenue from. Jonathan, I want to say it's about it's less than ten dollars a ticket. It's seven dollars, I think, is what the, the state of Florida basically gobbles up pretty much everything that is written on the, with these uniform traffic citations. Well, that's a revelation. I wasn't aware of yes. that. Yes, um, but the red light running campaigns, and if you notice, there's been class action lawsuits statewide, and many cities are backing away from it because of the constitutional legalities of them so and to put them on a state road is very very difficult and the state basically takes all the revenue because they say it's our state road so um, it's not something i would be supportive now traffic monitoring cameras like we're talking about with dot the more the merrier because we can monitor those traffics and look to, uh, to see for concentrated areas and actually it will <clears throat> those cameras can be uh, recorded so that if we do have a crash we can actually play it back and, and see it for ourselves well, I'm not advocating it. I'm just uh, wondering, <laughs> do they work? And uh, they they're de mixed, a lot of people off, mixed sure. debates. To be honest with you, Mayor, it's a great question because in many cities, they have shown that some reduction, but they've also shown some increases. Instead of having people um, t-boned in an intersection for running a red light, now they're getting rear-ended because somebody panics and slams their brakes on as they approach a, a light, knowing that there's a camera on it and the guy behind him doesn't make it. And rear ends them so <laughs> it's a very mixed bag oh, wow. and the revenue aspect of it oftentimes causes a lot of consternation with the public right any other questions well thank you for all you do we know it's a <laughs> almost a
catch 22 impossible challenges at times, but we thank you. Keeping us busy, Anything but we have, you do we have great staff that do a tremendous keep job. Keep making that a priority to help uh, control our traffic. We thank you, Mayor. It. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> uh, this week I received uh, two very interesting phone calls, one from our federal lobbyist. And as you know, you probably heard in the news, the United States Congress and Senate is um, looking into a third stimulus package for infrastructure. And the federal lobbyists have requested that we give them three placeholders um, for that money. And like I said, we can change those. And uh, first off is water. One of the things from a long-term perspective and Mrs. Craig and I are sitting down tomorrow to figure out that plan is, is how do we retrofit our current water plants to get off the MIAC system. The second thing, and that's about 25 million estimate, and we're going to try to work those details out tomorrow. The second one is our public safety complex, $40 million. And then the other one we thought was the lakefront enhancements. And, and again, haven't come up with a number, I got to get with Stephanie on that. Now, what's happened with that is it's delayed, so we have some time to do that, but they still requested the placeholder. The other thing that ca came to fruition this week is Mr. Soto's office has contacted us and they are reestablishing earmarks in the Congress and he's going to have between 12 and 14 million dollars in his district that he can assign as an earmark. And if you recall back several weeks ago, I gave you a pamphlet for our state legislature and one of the things was the expansion of our re reuse storage facility. And so I'd like to, and I have to have this in by next Friday, the forms to Mr. Soto's office. Uh, half of it's a $2.5 million project to expand that reuse. And I'm going to have Marjorie talk about that for a minute. So that'd be half of that money that we would need to do that. Um, our uh, sewer fund, where the rest of that fund is very solvent right now, and that would include construction and, and, and the engineering and construction of that. So I'm going to have Marjorie talk about that for a minute and just see if you want to move forward with that. But time is of the essence, and, and I think it's a good project. We did reach out to him. He loved the project, so I think we would, he would give us his support. Marjorie Craig. Ms. Craig. Hi, thank you. Marjorie Craig, Environmental Utilities Director. Um, and this particular project, and you all have been, been here longer than I have, and you know that during the dry season that we tend to run out of reuse water. We have about 89 million gallons of storage uh, in, at the wastewater treatment plant, but that's not enough. We still run out of water. So we are proposing to expand that storage pond system by an additional 36 million gallons uh, with the land that we have that's existing at the wastewater plant and that will provide additional storage. We don't think it's all that we're going to need, but it's, it's probably about half of what we need. Uh, so, and it's on land that we already uh, own. So there would not be a delay except for going ahead and uh, retaining an engineer to do the design and our permitting and then getting the construction project. So we wouldn't have to purchase land to do that additional 36 mil million gallons of storage. So the estimation is about $2.5 million. Could be a little bit more. Construction costs have been escalating pretty high. You guys probably know that. Uh, but that's our estimate right now. And we really, really need that additional storage. Well, I certainly think that's an incredible project that we certainly need to support. It's very frustrating during, you know, the summer months when you have subdivisions and residents that you're forced to go on reclaimed water, and uh, then they're not able to water their lawns, and they get a little irate when their grass starts dying and, and uh, their shrubbery and so on. And I certainly think uh, that would be a great priority, and I think it's something that well, I know uh, Congressman Soto I had a discussion with him. He would be very amenable to that. Uh, and uh, he's very supportive to doing something significant for St. Cloud. And so uh, I think that would be a great project. Plus, it, we, we would be investing money into it, would make, which would make it even more appealable. We're not asking them to finance the whole, the whole amount. Any other discussion? Yeah. Um, thank you, Mayor. Why, don't, why can't we look at doing 100 percent, not just 50 percent? We are, but sometimes, I, and we could. We just have to buy some additional land. So that requires more planning. A lot of times, it kind of depends on what they're looking for. Sometimes they're ready for something that's ready to go. Uh, but now that he's, he's okayed that, it just, we can explore that. 
can't, can't go deeper or something like that? No, that water table just, you know, okay. <laughs> just too high. Run in the water. And you guys, I've been telling you, as we've been tightening up the I&I and &I in the sewer system, we're going to run out sooner. We are uh, working on an interconnect with Toho, more than one place if possible, so for Is, re reuse also. I mean, it doesn't have, I guess it doesn't have to be there, right? It does I mean you can pipe it to another location? Of course, there's a cost that goes associated with that. It is, and we had found uh, we had every time right now that we find some land that we think we could put a stormwater pond or the joint use facility, somebody snaps it up and starts developing it. So, it, the ideal piece of property would be very you know proximate to the wastewater plant. Uh, you could pipe it, uh, and we're we're also looking at is there. Regional stormwater ponds. I think we had maybe talked about the conceptually. I brought that up a few months ago or six weeks ago. Seems like three years ago. But we, there, we're trying to really optimize all the resources that we can, including stormwater, reuse, potable water, interconnects, uh, water conservation, everything. And it's just going to take everybody and a and a really a really strong water conservation ethic. Mm -hmm. to get us through all of this. What, what are we talking in land-wise? I mean, you're saying you need land. How much land would you need? I guess it depends on how deep you could go, right? Well, I don't know that. Enough <laughs> for another, well, en enough for, uh, we've just estimated that we think we need another 80, we have 89 million gallons. We think we need another 89 million gallons. Okay. So Acreage, what are we looking for? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. But I can get back to you on that. Okay. Because we number. do have some city land. I keep throwing out Indiana Ave's 50 acres there, but it seemed like we're not going to develop. And we talked about putting um, baseball fields, but I don't see that happening with residential on both sides or eventually residential on both sides. So, I mean, it's not too far from you, but I mean, we should look into things like that. If you have any suggestions, I mean, you'll, if you ask Mr. Sturgeon, he'll tell you I'm always, did you? Have you seen Have you seen this piece of property? We we we're we've been really actively looking for solutions. Okay. No, for it. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I was thinking, I, I support the project, but the only thing I was thinking was, when you dig the dirt, you ought to try to find a place to use it in your master plan. <laughs> you know, you were just saying Chisholm Park has a lot of areas that are low and wet. I was like, oh, well, if you dig this and you get the dirt, you ought to move it over to Chisholm Park. So that's all I was thinking. I told you before that you have some of the same, I mean, I was thinking that when I was looking at the cost assessment even today, where sure. could we use that? If it's good fill. If it's good dirt. And I think, don't you guys line those those ponds? So I don't know if the groundwater table is as impactful when you line the ponds, but you'll you'll figure all that stuff out. But I, I support the project, and I would like if we could do 80-20. <laughs> but I know, like, you know, opportunities usually come with some, they want some skin in the game, which usually 80-20 gives you that skin. Um, depends if they want it shovel-ready or when you have to build it or, you know, all those factors. But um, I, I support it. And I would have had more facts for you probably, but this was like, he just told me about it an hour ago, and, and <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I feel like I've had two really good things. It's been like, like Christmas today. <laughs> Money falling from the sky. Well, the, the, the settlement agreement also, it, it's, I, I'm an environmentalist. I want to protect the environment, but it's got to be, you know, we, yeah. we've got to protect the, if it's not, it's got to be right. Councilman Trace. Yeah, so I have a specific question on that. Is that, so you guys are um, expanding those reuse ponds to that little bit of property to the east that is still owned by the city, like over by the golf course? That's my understanding. Okay. But um, I can bring you a map. I can, you know. Okay, yeah, I was just trying to figure out where it goes, and it's, you're not impacting the golf course at all. You're just going that no, little, little no. sliver we own. It's just so. a, we wish we had more land. Okay. I've got two ideas I want to talk to you afterwards about that. Um, and then did you need any direction on the other three items you mentioned or just No, that? I was asking if he, if he had any objection because, like I said, they are placeholders. The way it was explained to me, if we want to go back and change it, they just want to, you know, kind of put our foot in there and say, hey, we want this much money for these projects. Um, and, and we've got time to come back and discuss, and, and as soon as I get more information, I will email you, and then we'll bring it up publicly again. But you do need to move forward on yeah, I'm in favor of the two and a half million too. I don't know if you need formal direction or if three nods is enough. The three nods would be enough. Thank you. Um, and then I, 
missing from that list of the other three is any roadway project, any... We have um, Mudder Road still out there. I know Neptune, Canoe so, Creek. So, um, yes, from a, from a federal perspective, we spoke to the county the other day, and anything like that, like Canoe Creek and all that, we would partner with the county for any federal funds. Um, and interestingly, what I was told was that those projects are pretty small-scale projects for federal funding. But, but we did discuss, we had a nice meeting with the county about those kind of projects. Um, you know, as far as Mudder Road, that's something there. We haven't had that public meeting yet, you know, and decide, you know, we've gone back and forth as a road, as a trail. We need to have that meeting. Hopefully in the next several months we can get that moving again and find out what we're going to do. So we have money budgeted for that again, but I think we need more deliberation on that before we move forward. Okay. And I don't know if um, adding to the public safety com complex, I think that was adding a station there too or was that just the headquarters that was just oh. the uh, public safety emergency operations center communication center training facility and storage okay so then the hq would just move over there from station one the 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 office staff would move into that public safety building that would be the intent yes if we get the federal funding if not we'd have to go back and look at a different model because if this is too small i didn't know if we could just add some of the other projects you know the two stations um chief miller keeps on talking about just make it a a bigger right actually right now and I met with finance in our budget performance meeting we have, we feel like we have the money to, to, to cash flow that in the next several years okay. from impact fees and uh, penny sales tax All right. thanks <laughs> anything else from the council anything else from you mr. Sturgeon? thank you mayor thank you very much Councilmember Matheny. I don't have anything. Thank you. Councilmember Askew. Um, I just want to thank uh, Representative Hawkins for supporting the city of St. Cloud and all this. Um, mm. He hit the ground running and uh, he's really fighting for us up there. So I really appreciate his assistance. Ditto. Councilmember Trice. Uh, nothing further. Thank you. Um, let's see. And I don't have anything new to add either. Miss Mashir. That brings us to our information and report section. Thursday, April the 1st, there will be a community redevelopment agency meeting at 6 p.m. here in City Hall Council Chambers. Am I reading from the right thing here? Thursday, April the 8th, there will be a city council meeting at 6.30 p.m. at City Hall Council Chambers. Thursday, April the 15th, there will be a city council workshop at 3 p.m. at City, uh, city Hall Council Chambers. Thursday, April the 22nd, there will be a city council meeting at 6.30 p.m. at City Hall Council Chambers also. I'd like to also announce that on Saturday the 27th, uh, this weekend, there'll be the 27th annual battle at Narcusi Mill at Chisholm Park. Wednesday, March the 31st, there will be a food distribution at Cornerstone Church on 2925 Canoe Creek Road. Um, Monday, April the 19th, uh, there will be a St. Cloud Main Street historic dinner and documentary. Uh, and you can check on that on uh, the Main Street website, and I'm sure the city website. i uh, also like to just, if anyone's listening to this out there, uh, you need to check out uh, some of the upcoming events that Park and Rec are sponsoring, especially as they're approaching Easter. They really will have a lot of uh, exciting, fun events coming up. We hope you'll take, uh, our residents will take advantage of. And they, they send out some great emails with every single event on it, so sign yeah. up for those emails. Yeah, and so... Uh, uh, don't miss, there's a lot of great activities going on sponsored by our city. I'd like to remind our council that the warrant list number eight is available for you to review. And the tree advisory committee meeting minutes for October the 20th have been approved. With that, there's nothing else on our agenda. Oh, I would like to add by way of announcement that uh, the Governor DeSantis announced today new 
eligibility guidelines for COVID-19 vaccinations for Florida beginning Monday, the 29th. All individuals 40 years of age and older will be eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine beginning Monday, uh, April the 5th. All individuals age 18 and older will be eligible to receive the vaccine and you are encouraged to pre-register at www.myvaccineflorida.gov. With that, we are adjourned.